to you right off the bat. Top five questions. How do we know the Bible is trustworthy? That's number one. Number two, is Jesus the only way to God? Number three, why is there so much injustice in the church? Number four, what if someone never hears the gospel? And number five, if God is good, why is there so much evil in the world? And number five was by far the most common question that we got. Why, if God is good, why is there so much evil in the world? And those are all excellent questions. And they each deserve robust answers. Every one of those questions has had dozens and hundreds of books written to answer them. And so for the next five weeks, or at least five weeks, we're going to be in a series called Hard Questions. That's the name of this series title. Well, we're going, to, we're going to attempt to answer those five questions together. We're going to dedicate at least a week to each of those five questions. Now, as we were planning this series, there are three reasons that we wanted to go through a series like this. So three reasons for this series. Number one, most obviously, we want to equip you with answers to the questions. We want to help you answer the questions. That's the, the main, most obvious reason. Equip you with answers to these difficult questions. But that's not the only reason. The second reason is we wanted to show you that even the hardest questions have answers. Even the hardest questions have answers. We wanted to show you that just because you have questions doesn't mean there are no answers. It just means that you haven't found the answer yet. So when you have a question about your faith and you don't know the answer to it, you have to learn not to think, oh, Christianity must not be true, and instead think, I trust God, even though I don't understand right now, and then start doing some research. Start reading. Start figuring out the answers to these questions. So that's the second reason, to show you that even the hardest questions have answers. And number three, the third reason that we want to do this series is to practice forming our beliefs from Scripture. Practice forming our beliefs from Scripture. We want to demonstrate that as Christians, our beliefs come from the Word of God. Not from our feelings, not our desires, not our opinions, not our presuppositions. We must be governed by God and His Word, not by ourselves and what we want to be true. So in this series, the Bible is, is probably going to give us some answers that we don't really like. We don't prefer the answer that the Bible gives. They, they might not feel good to us. And we have to learn that that doesn't mean they aren't true. It just means that our desires and our emotions are not in line with God's reality. And we have, an option, we have an opportunity to choose to submit to God in those moments. So those are our three main reasons for wanting to do this sermon series. Equip you with an answer to show that even the hardest questions have answers, and then to practice forming our beliefs around Scripture. But our, our overarching goal uh, over this whole series is not just to answer these specific questions, but to help you build a sturdy and strong and beautiful Christian worldview that is strong enough to withstand questions like these. So you're going to get more questions than these five as you live out your Christian life. We want to help you build a worldview that doesn't fall over as soon as you get asked a difficult question. But in order to build a big, sturdy, beautiful Christian worldview, uh, just like any building project, you first need a strong foundation. We have to have a strong foundation that we can build upon, and that's our topic for today's sermon. Uh, if, if you were out on campus, or maybe you're at your job next week, and somebody came up to you, and they asked you one of these hard questions that we're going to cover in this series, and let's say you gave them the answer that we come to in this series, their next question to you is going to be, but how do you know? Right? They're going to ask, how do you know? And, and you might try to find some, you know, some evidence for your answer out in the world, or, or you might appeal to the authority of an expert who said something similar, or you might try to reconstruct the argument from this sermon series. But at the end of the day, you and I are going to be forced to say, because the Bible says so. At the end of the day, that's the answer that we have, because the Bible says so. And, and I want to contend today that that is not a stupid answer. That's actually a fantastic answer for you to give. For the Christian, the only ultimate source of authority that we have is the Bible. We believe that our Bibles are perfect and good and right and true, and we believe that they contain everything that you need to live out a faithful Christian life, including the ability to answer these questions that we're going to go through in this series. And so throughout this series, we are going to be finding our answers in the Bible. There's going to be lots of other resources and quotes and evidence and logic, but, but our foundation, our authority, is the Bible. And therefore, the first question that we need to tackle as we start this series is how do we know that the Bible is trustworthy? 
How do we know that the Bible is trustworthy? Who cares what the Bible says if it is not a trustworthy resource? If we want to build a big, sturdy, beautiful Christian worldview, then we need a firm foundation. And that foundation is the Bible. Uh, so you've probably, you've probably been in a situation or witnessed a situation where the trustworthiness of the Bible was brought into question. Right, so maybe, uh, maybe you or somebody you knew was a freshman in college and you took a Philosophy 101 class. And it was taught by some bitter grad student who made it his life mission to dismantle any Christianity to be found in the class. And so some topic comes up and the Christian student bravely disagrees with the professor. And the teacher, uh, the teacher, usually not a professor, just a teacher, the teacher asks, who says? And the student says, the Bible. The Bible says. And the teacher, grinning ear to ear now. This is exactly what they wanted to hear. They're about to make a mockery of this poor 19-year-old kid in their Philosophy 101 class. So he starts to just attack those beliefs, right? What makes the Bible so special? Why not other holy books? Don't you know the Bible was written by a bunch of misogynistic men who are just trying to preserve their own power? We don't even know what the Bible actually said. It's been twisted by translators for 2,000 years. Why should anybody else care what your favorite book says? And this poor student, who didn't really know what he's getting into, uh, tries to come up with an answer. Right? Thinks, that, well, I, that's just how I was raised. Now the teacher's even more excited. What, so if you were born into a different family, you would believe something different? What if you were born into a family of a different religion? Then would your beliefs change? Haven't you learned by now that your parents aren't always correct? And the student tries to think of another answer. Well, yeah, but I mean, the Bible's just changed my life. It's changed my life. And the teacher jumps on him again. Oh, so all of us are supposed to change what we believe just because you liked something? Don't you think anybody else ever converted to um, more Muslim, anybody else became a Buddhist or a Muslim and saw their lives improve? Why should we care just because it worked for you. And so this brave 19-year-old sits down in their seat, uh, discouraged, dejected, questioning his faith, and the arrogant teacher continues on in his lecture. You've probably been in a situation like that, or you will be in a situation like that. And today, I want to help you avoid that situation. I want to teach you how to answer those types of objections. And I want to give you rock-solid faith in the trustworthiness of the Bible. That's my goal today. So we're going to cover some basic facts about the Bible, what it is, how it came to be, and then I want to look at seven reasons that we can trust our Bibles. These are in your note sheets. Hopefully you have that note sheet out in front of you. Seven reasons we can trust our Bible. So that's the outline today. Uh, let's cover some basic facts first. What is the Bible? What is the Bible? The Bible is a collection of 66 books written by over 40 authors in three languages over a span of 1,500 years that tells one cohesive story about God's love of mankind through the salvation provided by His Son, Jesus. So 66 books, three languages, 40 authors, 1,500 years, one story. One cohesive story about God's love of mankind in, in the salvation provided by his son. Uh, your Bible is split into two parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, the Old Testament, about the first two-thirds of your Bible, consists of 39 books. And it tells the story of God building for himself a nation, the, the people of Israel, through whom a Savior will come. So that's the basic plot of the Old Testament, building a nation through whom a Savior will come. The Old Testament was written in the Hebrew language, and it was gathered together by Jewish rabbis and Jewish scholars into collections of books. The New Testament, the last third of your Bible, consists of 27 books, and it tells the story of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and then it gives descriptions and instructions on how he wants his church to function and to spread. That's what the New Testament is about. Uh, the New Testament was written almost entirely in Greek with a little bit of Aramaic in there. And by the end of the 4th century AD, all 66 books of the Bible had been collected and put together into the book that we have today. So that's when your Bible first came into being as one, uh, one book altogether. Now, after this happened, uh, after all the books were gathered together, the process of translation began. And fairly early on, the Bible was translated into Latin for use in Roman Catholic worship services. But in order to prevent people from reading the Bible for themselves, the Catholic Church prohibited anyone from translating the Bible into the common language, into the common tongue, so that nobody could read it except the priest who could read Latin. So the Bible stayed in Latin for a long time. 
Uh, here's this is just a tangential kind of a fun note in case you're interested. Uh, when it was originally written, the Bible didn't have chapter or verse divisions. I don't know if you knew that, but it was just letters. It was just big long letters, big long stories. It wasn't divided up. Uh, so in 1227, a man named Stephen Langton divided the Bible into chapters. That's where your chapter divisions come from, Stephen Langton, 1227. Uh, in 1449, a Jewish rabbi named Nathan divided the Old Testament into verses. That's where your verses come from in the Old Testament. And then in 1550, a man named Stephanus divided the New Testament into verses. So that's where we get the divisions that we have in our Bibles today. You could actually, you could go online and purchase a 1550 Stephanus Greek text that has no verse divisions. And then you could purchase a 1551 Stephanus Greek text that has the verse divisions. Like you can see it play out in real time that way. They're crazy expensive, but they are out there. You could go buy one if you really wanted to. Uh, so that's just a little fun note in case anybody is interested. Uh, the first time the Bible became available in English was in 1382, when a brave man named John Wycliffe translated the Latin Bible into English so that everybody could read it. And this, this action enraged the Catholic Church, but unfortunately for them, Wycliffe died of a stroke before they could execute him. So, instead, they dug up his bones and burned his bones. That was the best they could do to get back at him. So, that was 1382. In 1527, so 150 years later, a man named William Tyndall became the first person to translate the Bible into English out of the original Greek and Hebrew. Okay, so Wycliffe translated it from the Latin into English. Tyndale translated it from the actual Greek and Hebrew into English. This was called the Tyndale Bible. You, you could pull up a Tyndale Bible on your phone right now in English and you could read it. Uh, you'll be very thankful that we have more modern translations because it's very hard to read, but you, you could go ahead and do it. Now, since then, since 1580, 1527, there have been hundreds of different translations into English and then thousands of translations into different languages. You, you probably either have an ESV Bible, which was translated in 2001, or you might have an NIV Bible, which was translated in 1978. Those are kind of the two most common Bibles that people carry around. So there's a simple five-minute version of what the Bible is and where we got it. Now, here's where we get into the meat of this, this sermon. Seven reasons that we can trust the Bible that we hold in our hands. Seven reasons we can trust the Bible. You should follow along in that note sheet to, to make sure you, you know where we're at. Number one, first reason, is unmatched manuscript evidence. Unmatched manuscript evidence. Uh, when, a, when a textual scholar, so people who study ancient texts, when they seek to identify the trustworthiness or, or the veracity of an ancient document, like the Bible, uh, there are a few factors that they consider. There are two main factors. Number one, the number of manuscripts available. How many manuscripts do we have? And number two, how much time was there between the original writing and the manuscripts? Okay, so the number of manuscripts and the length of time between the manuscripts. If you have a document with lots of manuscripts that date very close to the original writing, you can be virtually 100% sure that you have an accurate manuscript, an accurate translation in your hands. If you have very few manuscripts that are a long way separated from the original writing, then there's a little bit less certainty that you have the right, um, the, the right content in your hands. So let's look at, take a look at uh, some of the most famous and universally accepted historical documents that we have in, in the English-speaking language right now. Uh, so let, let's just go through a few of these. Um, Aristotle's Poetics. His Poetics. We have 10 manuscripts, and the earliest one dates to about 1,000 years after the original writing. 10 manuscripts, 1,000 years. Um, Homer's Iliad. This is a huge deal in, in a lot of your, your college classes and things like that. We have 643 manuscripts. 1,500 years after the original writing, 643. Um, Caesar's Gaelic Wars, we have 10 manuscripts, 900 years after the original writing. Herodotus's History, we have eight manuscripts, 1,300 years after the original writing. Josephus's Works, we have 133 manuscripts, 800 years after the original writing. So that's pretty good. That's quite a few manuscripts, not that far from the original writing. I have a copy of Josephus's Works at my house. It, it's a fantastic book to, to have. Um, Plato's Tetralogies, we have seven manuscripts, 750 years after the original writing. And so you can start to see that many of the most popular ancient works that we have today have around, you know, between 10 to 100 manuscripts available, and they're about a thousand years after it was originally written. And again, all of these documents, all of these books right here, are universally accepted as accurate. 
Nobody questions the accuracy of any of these documents. I, I guarantee you, if you have an English 101 class where you're reading Herodotus, your professor will not say, well, we don't really know if what we have today is what Herodotus really wrote. Guarantee they're not going to say that. We all believe we have what Herodotus really wrote down, even though we have eight manuscripts dating to 1,300 years after the original writing. And so, why do I bring all that up? Well, let's compare these popular ancient works with the New Testament of the Bible. So you can look at all of these other works. In the New Testament, we have over 30,000 manuscripts dating to within 40 to 130 years after the original writing. 30,000 manuscripts, 40 to 130 years after the original writing. So take just a minute to, to, to recognize the magnitude of difference here. There are about a hundred times as many manuscripts of the Bible as any other ancient text. And those manuscripts are about ten times closer to the original writing than any other ancient text. So, in other words, if this was a foot race, okay, we're running a hundred meter dash, this is Usain Bolt up against some of those babies up there that don't yet know how to walk. Like, this isn't even, we're not even in the same world here when you're comparing the Bible with other ancient texts. And these 30,000 manuscripts, they've been found all over the ancient Near East, which means that we're able to compare, say, a, a manuscript found in Syria to a manuscript found in Egypt and see if there are any differences or discrepancies. And when all of those comparisons are made between all 30,000 manuscripts, we find that there is not one significant difference between the manuscript sources. There are a handful of like misspellings or a different punctuation here or there, but there are zero different words, zero different sentences, zero different concepts. The only way to call the Bible unreliable is to throw out every single thing written prior to about 200 years ago. But, like, we have more historical evidence for the accuracy of the Bible than we do the Gettysburg Address. Did you know that? We would have to throw everything else out. There was a historian named John Montgomery who wrote, to be skeptical of the resultant text of the New Testament book, books is to allow all of classical history to slip into obscurity. For no documents of the ancient period are as well attested bibliographically as the New Testament. By every metric that a textual scholar would look at, we can know with absolute certainty that the Bible we have in our hands today is what was written by the original authors. So that's our first reason. Unmatched manuscript evidence. Number two. Translation excellence. Translation excellence. Uh, many people that are critical of the trustworthiness of the Bible will say something like, the Bible we have today isn't what was originally said because for 2,000 years they've been twisting it in different translations. Right? You've probably heard that argument before. So when these people, these critics, think of the translation process, they picture something like the telephone game. Right? You're standing in a line, one person whispers something into the next person's ear, they whisper it to the next person, you get to the end of the line, and that person doesn't have any idea what the first person said. Like the, the messages are way off. That's how they're picturing the translation process works. They think, you know, first we had the original writings, then it was translated into Latin, then Latin into German, and then German into Old English, and then Old English into Modern English, and, and on and on. The problem is, that's not at all how translation works. That's not at all how translation works. You see, no translation is derived from a previous translation. They don't go to the previous translations to make the new translation. Each new translation is translated directly from the original Greek and Hebrew manuscripts. The 30,000 manuscripts that we were just talking about. So I, I almost always preach from the ESV, translated in 2001. So when the team of translators that wrote the ESV, when they went to, to, to work on that translation, they didn't just go to the NIV from 1978 and rewrite it. They didn't just write their own version of the NIV. No, they went to the earliest and most accurate Greek and Hebrew manuscripts available to us. And what this means is that over time, our translations are not getting less accurate. They're getting more accurate. Our translations are getting more accurate as time goes on. The more manuscripts we discover, the more archaeological and cultural context we discover, the more accurate our translations get. And the good news if you're still a skeptic and you're just like, I just can't trust English translations, nobody's forcing you to read the English. You could go learn Greek. 
You can learn Hebrew. You could go to a seminary class, learn it, and then just read it in the original languages. We have the text available to us. So you could go read the Bible in its original language and not have to rely on translation. If you have a decent English Bible, you can be confident that that Bible you hold in your hands is an accurate translation of the original language. So that's our second reason. Translation excellence. Third reason we can trust the Bible is corroborating historical evidence corroborating historical evidence. Here's what I mean. There has never been an archaeological or anthropological discovery that has proven anything in the Bible false. In fact, in the last 200 years, there have been over 22,000 archaeological digs related to the subject matter of the Bible, and not one of them, not one of them, have contradicted what we find in the Bible. Instead, almost all of them confirm information that we find in the Bible. So here's just, here's just a couple examples. You could go online and find dozens, hundreds of these tonight. But here's a couple to give you a taste of what I'm talking about. Um, prior to the 1860s, historians considered the, the narrative given in First and Second Kings uh, about the wars that Israel fought, they considered it fiction. They didn't think that those wars really happened. And then in 1868, a scholar in Jerusalem found a stone tablet called the Misha Stele, and this Misha Stele was written by the king of Moab, and it tells the story of a war that Moab fought with Israel in 850 BC, which is exactly when First and Second Kings records that event. So we prove that those events really did happen. Um, Genesis 19 records that the ancient cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were judged by God for their wickedness, and that he destroyed the cities with brimstone and fire. And most people have considered that story just a fable. It's meant to scare people into obedience, God will rain down fire on you. But then just a couple years ago, Nature Journal published a peer-reviewed article claiming that a meteoric airburst, that's their language, meteoric airburst devastated that entire region in about 1700 BC, which is exactly when Genesis says that it happens. Meteoric airburst sounds a lot like fire and brimstone coming down from heaven, right? Now, so there's another example. Uh, here's another one. King David has long been considered a fictional character in the biblical story. And then in 1993, a researcher discovered a tablet called the Tel Dan Stele in northern Israel, dated to the 9th century BC, which is when David was in power, and it talks about the house of King David. It actually names David uh, on that stele. Uh, here's another one. We found ancient Babylonian records that describe a, both a sudden confusion of languages, which confirms the biblical story of the Tower of Babel, and that describe a worldwide flood which confirms the story of the flood in Genesis. In fact, you're probably aware, hundreds of different cultures all have a record of a worldwide flood happening right when the Bible says that the flood actually happened. So we could just go on and on and on. The more historical evidence we discover, the more the Bible is proven true. This has led archaeologist Dr. Nelson Gluick to declare, no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. No archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. So that's our third reason that we can trust the Bible, corroborating historical evidence. Now, these last three reasons have been all external sources. Here's reasons out there in the world that we can trust the Bible. For the next four, uh, I want to turn inward. We're going to look at some of the internal evidence for the trustworthiness of Scripture, some of the ways that the Bible proves itself to be true. So here's number four, divine inspiration divine inspiration. The, the Bible teaches that it is not just the personal opinions of some guys 2,000 years ago, but rather that God himself inspired the authors to write down what they wrote. Now, 2 Timothy 3.16 that Sammy read right before we worshiped together says that all scripture is breathed out by God. Breathed out by God. The, the Greek word here is theonoustos. Theonoustos. So let's break it into its root words. Theo means God, theology. Um, nu, P-N-E-U, means breath or air. So think pneumonia or pneumatics or something like that. It means air or breath. And then tos means something done by God. So literally, theonoustos means that the scriptures were breathed out by God. They are the air of God through human authors. Second uh, Peter 1 Verses 20 and 21 says, Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. 
So again, these guys aren't making this stuff up. They were carried along by the Holy Spirit and led to write down what God wants them to write. Uh, Hebrews 1.1 says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. So many times and many ways. This means that God spoke through various authors using various means. So visions, parables, prophecies, types, symbols, shadows, all of it, to communicate with and to give them his word. But the Bible teaches a doctrine called verbal inspiration. Verbal inspiration that you should be a little bit familiar with. Verbal inspiration is the doctrine that God divinely inspired the biblical writers to use their own personalities, their own vocabulary, and their own writing styles to impart his word to humanity. Okay, so that's the reason different books that are written by different people don't all sound exactly the same. Because God inspired the writers to use their own personality, their own context, their own vocab to write down his word. The verbal inspiration. So that's the fourth reason the Bible is trustworthy. It is not just the words of men, it is divinely inspired. Number five, falsifiable eyewitness accounts. We can trust the Bible because it is made up of falsifiable eyewitness accounts. Pay attention. Falsifiable doesn't mean false or falsified. Those are different words that mean different things. Falsifiable. Here's what I mean. Uh, When you are investigating the trustworthiness of a historical claim or historical document, one of the top criteria you would use is eyewitness testimonies. So if somebody went to the police to report a crime, but there were zero eyewitnesses, it's pretty hard to convict somebody on that crime. It's just one person's word against the other. But if somebody went to the police to report a crime and there are a dozen eyewitnesses who all said the same thing, they all saw the exact same thing, that's an easy crime to convict. It's easy to know what happened there. So imagine, for example, that somebody wrote a book tomorrow called The Twin Towers Hoax. And they claimed that on 9-11, the Twin Towers never actually fell down. They're still standing today. Twin Towers never fell down during 9-11. What would happen? What would happen when they wrote that book? Well, thousands of people would say, that's not true. Like, I was there. I watched it on TV. I've been to Ground Zero. I've seen the monument there. My, I have relatives who died in 9-11 when the buildings fell down. Like, we all know it was true. We were there. It was only 20 years ago. Now, here's my point. The New Testament was written within the lifetime of eyewitnesses. It was written within the lifetime of hundreds of eyewitnesses. These books that report miraculous things that Jesus said and did, they didn't just pop up hundreds of years later, after everybody had died and the story's gotten vague and things like that. The books appeared only a decade or two after the events happened. So this is about the same amount of time between us right now and 9-11, right? That was 22 years ago. So here's how Peter explains this in 2 Peter. He says, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So Peter's saying, we're not just jumping on some fictional bandwagon. We were there. We were there in person, and we saw this stuff happen. In 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul summarizes the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus by saying, in verse 3, For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the Twelve, then then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. So as Paul is writing this account of what happened to Jesus, the majority of those eyewitnesses are still living. They're still living as they receive this letter. So if this letter were just full of Paul's personal opinions and fake history, things that didn't really happen, there would have been an immediate uproar and the letter would have been destroyed. That's what happened to dozens of other books that claimed to be the Word of God, but they were demonstrably false. You might be familiar with the Gospel of Philip says that Jesus was married, but Philip wrote the Gospel of Philip, and everybody that knew Jesus was like, no, he wasn't, and they threw the book away. And that's why you've probably never read the Gospel of Philip. That happened all the time. So we have hundreds of eyewitnesses who were present for the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and they are receiving and reading these books of the, Old Te- of the New Testament, and they're saying, yes, 
That's true. That is what I saw. I was an eyewitness. Uh, there was a Los Angeles homicide detective named Jim Warner Wallace. And he, he decided to, to test the trustworthiness of the Bible using all the techniques that he would use to find the truth of a homicide case. And he compiled all his evidence into an excellent book. It's called Cold Case Christianity. I, I recommend you read it. But he concluded, J. Warner Wallace said, the Christian tradition is actually intellectually robust and satisfying, even if we believers are occasionally unable to respond to your challenges. The answers are available. You don't have to turn off your brain to be a believer. Yes, it is possible to become a Christian because of the evidence, rather than in spite of the evidence. We can trust the Bible because it is fundamentally an eyewitness account. That's our fifth point today. Number six, narrative cohesivity. Narrative cohesivity. Here's what I mean by narrative cohesivity. Uh, the, the narrative harmony of the story of the Bible testifies that its author is divine, not human. Okay, the cohesivity testifies that the author is divine, not human. The, the Bible, you'll remember, consists of 66 books, over 40 authors, 1,500 years, three languages, three continents, and it tells one cohesive story from cover to cover with zero contradictions. That's what we have in our hands. Uh, here's one way to look at it. Have you ever been reading, maybe you're reading a book or you're watching a movie, and a character says something at the beginning of the book or movie, and then later on toward the end, that phrase or that idea comes back up toward the end, and it kind of ties the whole story back together. Probably familiar with movies do this all the time. Uh, when an author or when a director can do this, you know, multiple times in a book or in a movie, twice, three times, four times, but we consider them brilliant and insightful. You watch a movie like Inception and you're going to see three or four or five of these things happen. That's why Christopher Nolan's one of the best ever. Uh, it, it's even more impressive if one person starts a book and another person finishes the book and they still have these kinds of tie-ins. Right? So uh, a couple years ago, I read the, the Dune series. I read a whole bunch of the Dune books. The first six books were written by Frank Herbert, and then the last like 19 books were written by his son, um, Brian Herbert. So when you see the later books written by Brian, reference back to the earlier books written by Frank, you, you get this distinct sense of like cohesivity and almost transcendence to the work, that this story is so well thought out and so well tied together. Now, why am I telling you all that stuff? Uh, the Bible doesn't contain one cross-reference, or two, or three, or five, or ten, or a hundred. The Bible contains 63,779 cross-references. 63,779. Here's a chart that maps every single one of those cross-references. So every line here at the bottom is a chapter in your Bible. Is a chapter in your Bible, and then every colored line is a reference, a cross-reference from one section of the Bible to another. 63,779 explicit cross-references. If our Bibles were written by one person, we would consider them the greatest, the most masterful, most brilliant author in history, bar none. Wouldn't even be a competition. But here's where it gets really crazy. Remember, the Bible wasn't written by one person. It's written by over 40 authors, over 1,500 years, and still this level of narrative cohesivity. To, to compare the Bible with any other ancient text in terms of its cohesivity is like comparing a match with the sun. It's in a class of its own. The only logical answer to how this book came to be is if there is an all-powerful author writing the story. It's the only way something like this could be possible. It's an all-powerful author. So that's the sixth reason that we can trust the Bible. Narrative cohesivity. And finally, our last reason, number seven. Fulfilled prophecy. Fulfilled prophecy. The Bible is full of prophecies. Now, I'm not talking about fad prophecy, like you're at a Christian conference and you're standing there with a thousand other people and the guy on stage says, I sense somebody has back pain. And you're like, one in four people have back pain. That's, that's just stats. That's not prophecy. Uh, I'm not talking about that kind of prophecy. I mean specific prophecies with specific fulfillments, often with centuries in between. But the Bible contains 2,500 of these prophecies. 2,000 of them are already fulfilled. 500 are yet to be fulfilled. But every single one of them, so far, has come true. 
And many of these prophecies were given hundreds or even thousands of years before they were fulfilled. So I want to look at just, just a handful of the specific Old Testament prophecies about Jesus that he fulfilled. Okay, just eight of them. There are hundreds. We're going to look at just eight. Uh, Micah 5 says the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Isaiah 7 says the Messiah would be born of a virgin. Hosea 11 says the Messiah would end up in Egypt. Zechariah 9 says the Messiah would be carried by a donkey. Zechariah 11 says the Messiah would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Uh, Psalm 22 says the Messiah will die by crucifixion. This, by the way, it was 400 years before crucifixion was invented that this was prophesied about. Um, Isaiah 6 says the Messiah will speak in parables. And Isaiah 61 says the Messiah will set the captives free. Now, those are eight specific prophecies about Jesus, about the Messiah. Uh, there was an American professor in math and astronomy named Peter Stoner. Okay, Peter Stoner, math professor, he wrote a book called Science Speaks. And in that book, he applied the modern science of probability to just those eight prophecies. Remember, Jesus fulfilled hundreds. Just those eight, he applied probability to them. Here's what he says. Here's some quotes from his book. Stoner says, The chance that any man might have fulfilled all eight prophecies is one in ten to the seventeenth. So that would be one in one hundred quadrillion. Now, th that number's way bigger than we can conceptualize. So to illustrate this number, here's what he says. He says, If we take ten to the seventeenth silver dollars and lay them on the face of Texas, they will cover all of the state two feet deep. Now mark one of these silver dollars and stir the whole mass thoroughly. Blindfold a man, tell him he can travel as far as he wishes, but he must pick up that one marked silver dollar. What chance would he have of getting the right one? Just the same chance that the prophets would have had of writing those eight prophecies and having them all come true in any one man, provided they wrote them in their own wisdom. So if those eight prophecies are not from God, then the probability that they would come true is 1 in 10 to the 17th power. But remember, Jesus didn't just fulfill 8 prophecies. He fulfilled over 300 prophecies. That the presence of hundreds of specific prophecies and their specific fulfillments are evidence of the Bible's trustworthiness. That's our seventh reason. Uh, fulfilled prophecy. So there you have it. Seven reasons that we can trust the Bible unmatched manuscript evidence, translation excellence, corroborating historical evidence, divine inspiration, falsifiable eyewitness accounts, narrative cohesivity, and fulfilled prophecy. Now, why does all this matter? Why does it matter? Who cares whether the Bible is true or not? What difference does it make? Well, if the Bible is trustworthy, then God the Father is the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. Jesus is the only Son of God. Jesus is Lord of all creation. Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of a virgin. Jesus did suffer under Pontius Pilate. Jesus was crucified on a Roman cross. Jesus did pay the punishment for all of our sins. Jesus was buried in a Roman cross. Jesus did pay the punishment. Uh, Jesus did rise from the dead three days later. Jesus did defeat death once and for all in our place. Jesus is seated at the right hand of his Father. Jesus will come again to judge the living and the dead. We do have the Holy Spirit. We have been forgiven of all of our sins. We have been made new. We have been commissioned to go and make disciples of all nations. The church will not fail. Our bodies will be raised from the dead and we will spend eternity with God in heaven. If the Bible is not true, then none of this matters. You don't matter, and I don't matter. And none of this matters. We are all meaningless accidents on a big floating rock. But if the Bible is true, then everything changes. And I contend today that the Bible is absolutely true. And so, next week, when you end up in your Philosophy 101 class, and the teacher is trying to make you look dumb because you believe the Bible, you now have seven rock-solid reasons for believing the trustworthiness of Scripture. And my prayer for us is not only that these would make us more confident and bold with our faith, but also that it would help us see the value and the beauty in the Bibles that we have. Uh, I pray that this content would lead us to read our Bibles more and, and obey our Bibles and believe our Bibles and trust our Bibles and love our Bibles. Because our God wrote a book. And so we should be people of that book. So would you guys pray with me as we close and then we'll have some time for discussion questions to, get to flesh this out a little bit more. Would you pray with me? <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for this evening. The chance to worship together. 
and learn together. God, we thank you today that you have written a book that you didn't leave us to figure this out on our own, but you have, you have revealed yourself to us through your word, that, that your son came to verify the, the authority and the trustworthiness of that word, and that we today, as, as fallen rebellious sinners who go our own way every single day, that we can actually hear directly from you. We don't have to try to go find you out in nature or try to hear you from the clouds, but we actually have a book of words that you wrote. So God, would you give us confidence? Would you give us faith in the trustworthiness of your word? Would we believe that they are your words, that they have the power to transform us, that they are everything that we need uh, for the faithful Christian life? Give us that confidence. Give us that boldness. And God, would you equip us to answer hard questions about the trustworthiness of the Bible today? Lord, we love you. We trust you. And your sons, in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so... Uh, grab a person or two around you, get in a little small group, and, and let's spend a few minutes talking about this question. Which of these reasons is most helpful and convincing for you? And if you wanted to, you could say which of these is least helpful, least convincing for you as well. But let's just process this for a little bit, and then we'll come together and worship. So.